We're going on to the speaker of the night and um, um, Lauren. Um, I'm just going to introduce Lauren. Uh, recording is in progress. And, and by the way, it's on the Facebook site as well now. Um, Lauren Ray grew up in the busy suburbs outside of New York City. And when she had enough of that, she moved to Olympia, Washington, where she, where she earned her bachelor's of science at the Evergreen State College. After founding a mycology club on campus, she went on to become the program chair and chief mycologist for the South Sound Mushroom Club. Lauren has recently moved to Bellingham, and uh, we hope that she'll be able to come over and lead some forays in the near future. Lauren has been an active participant of the Fungal Diversity Survey, volunteering with the West Coast Rare Fungi Challenge and submitting specimens through several local projects. Lauren is interested in fungal ecology, taxonomy and phylogeny, especially within the wax gap family, Hygrophoraceae. She is also passionate about education and bringing greater awareness and understanding of fungal diversity. Um, Lauren? Yes, hi. Can I hand over to you? And yeah. uh, I'm going to put you on side by side view. Okay, and for anyone who wants to ask any questions during, um, I'd be happy to take them. I won't be able to see the chat. Um, I could also take questions at the end and look at the chat at the end. Uh, and if it's something I'm going to get to in the future, I'll just let you know that. Um, can you put it on to side-by-side -side speaker on yours? Because I'm having difficulty. Uh, there it is. There we go. And side-by-side um, -side view. And, if, and then as you start, you should be the one. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm so glad to be here. It's my first international presentation. And if any of you attended the webinar on this topic for NAMA, it'll be essentially the same presentation with a few updates and always, you know, slightly more um, variable information. So uh, thank you for being here again. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about the wax caps. So it's, I've got a lot of exciting information. This group of mushrooms is really just so gorgeous and fun to talk about. So uh, it's called Beauty, Mystery, and Discovery within Hygrophoraceae. Okay, presentation overview. I'll talk a little bit about the history of the family, some about their distribution, phylogeny, ecology, and community science findings. And David already introduced me. I won't go any more about myself. Um, just a couple of the clubs I've been involved with. A lot of the clubs uh, that I've been a part of have helped me learn so much about mushroom identification in general, but PSMS in Seattle and the South Sound Mushroom Club in Olympia were groups that really helped me get more involved with um, this family in particular, and also just community science and sequencing of specimens. Uh, and besides mushrooms, I also love to learn about lichens, which I'll talk a little bit about tonight, and uh, bryophytes, slime molds, plants, and other life forms that are kind of neglected. So, okay, let me move this uh, control thing here. Um, okay, great. So, history of Hygrophoraceae. Uh, so the type genus was Hygrophorus, and it was described in 1836 by uh, Elias Magnus Fries, and I think that's how you say his name. And the family was then erected in 1907 by Johannes Lotzi to accommodate mushrooms that have thick, waxy gills and white spores. Um, and it wasn't uh, broadly accepted until Singer revised the Agarikales in 1951. And this group of mushrooms is so distinctive to certain mycologists that there was a, I believe, French mycologist, Marcel Bon, who thought that the wax caps should be their own order, Hygrophorales, and that was not um, accepted in our modern understanding. But I just like to share that tidbit because 
they are pretty distinctive mushrooms. So there's around 28 modern genera. Uh, the numbers fluctuate depending on where you're looking. Wikipedia says 25, but then they list 27, and it doesn't include some that I had known about elsewhere. So I'd say 28 is a solid number uh, in our current understanding, and over 600 species worldwide, definitely way more than that. That's just like what we have listed uh, in our indexes. And there's a huge diversity of morphology, the ways that they look, the forms that they come in, as well as their ecology. And for etymology, meaning what the words mean of this nomenclature, hygro is water and forest is bearing. So water bearing mushrooms, they're quite wet and slimy a lot of the time. Oh, okay, let me see, there we go. So here's a screenshot of the observation map on iNaturalist for the family. And uh, it's not meant to really show you the entire range of all the mushrooms. Oh, this is, oh, this is from spring of 2022. Uh, actually, this is the original screenshot I had in this presentation. And I like to go back when I do the presentations again and uh, put the more uh, current number. So as of today, actually, I'm gonna pop over to this next slide. Looks pretty similar visually, mm -hmm. but there's actually like 35, 5,000 um, more observations in the nine months since I um, put these slides together. So lots of people out there observing mushrooms um, in this family. Not all the observations are necessarily um, fully identified and confirmed to be in the family, but just an idea kind of to, to really see what people are out there looking at and at least thinking that are in this family. Um, and they are worldwide, you know, not in every habitat, not in every Part of the world, but they do, you can find wax caps um, all around the globe. Okay, so North American genera. Um, so the, this is a long list, and I'm sure a lot of these are going to seem really foreign, and they still are to me. I haven't seen a lot of these genera. I'm hoping to, um, but I've kind of boxed off and bolded the more traditional um, genera of the wax cap, so Gleophorus, Hygrosibi, and Hygrophorus. And Hygrosibi and Hygrophorus were like the wax cap genera for a really long time. And only through more modern phylogenetic studies have we learned that these other groups um, belong, you know, they're closely related to and belong in this family. And some of them share similar characteristics and some of them don't to these traditional genera. Um, but yeah, it's expanding all the time, um, and it's been pretty surprising to learn that some mushrooms that look quite different um, actually are in this family. So these are ones you can find across this continent here. And then a visualization, this is from the iNaturalist, like about, if you press on about, you can get these nice little trees for any taxon that you want to look at. And it always helps me to just kind of understand where they fit in the nesting doll of life. So under kingdom fungi, they're within the basidiomycete fungi. And that's a lot of the macro fungi that we're looking at, not all of them. There's the ascomycetes as well. Um, and then going down a little further to the second star of the agaricales. And this is like the common guild mushroom order. It's not all of the guild mushrooms and not everything in the order is guild, um, but that's where the hygrophoresiae lie. And then we have family Hygrophoraceae and these four subfamilies within the family. So don't worry too much about all the details, just for all you, you know, taxonomy uh, oriented folks and mycologists out there. Um, and then this is from a really hefty paper by Jean Lodge and many of her collaborators called Molecular Phylogeny, Morphology, Pigment Chemistry, and Ecology in the Hygrophoraceae. And this is just kind of showing you from, from left to right, um, as you go over towards the right, it gets more specific. We've got the subfamilies here, those four we saw on the slide before this, and then a bunch of groups that were, you know, um, grouped together by their relation. We have tribes and we have genera. So lots of uh, scientific names here, but just so you can kind of see where everything fits together. And I do recommend checking out that paper if you want to learn more about this stuff. All right, so we'll talk now about some ecology of certain groups of waxy caps, and we'll start with the ectomycorrhizal group Hygrophorus. So Hygrophorus are known to be ectomycorrhizal with conifers, um, though there was a study that kind of showed that their mycelium doesn't 
or at least on some species, doesn't expand super far out into the soil and is kind of more bound towards the roots. And so they may be acting semi-parasitically and kind of getting more benefit out of, out of the relationship than their hosts, but we're not sure if this is always the case. Uh, but, you know, of all the different wax caps, you know, they, these are the ones that are thought to, to have these mycorrhizal connections. And um, in our area, larches up in higher elevations and a little bit more east, uh, pines, spruces are all mushrooms that you can find these associated fungi with. And there were some re revisions uh, recently, Agathos, Mrs. Ag Agathos moides now, and then the Olivaceae albus. There's quite a few species that look like that. Um, and Brene LaBeouf uh, over in east of you guys in Canada. I forget where she is exactly, but she's working a lot on hygrophorus and, and kind of figuring out how um, much diversity there is and how they're all related. So we've got a lot to learn about this genus still. And another uh, ecological niche that's a little bit more typical of, you know, mushrooms, it, it seems pretty straightforward. These are groups of uh, um, mushrooms and genera that will be growing on wood. So wood decaying sap robes, you'll find them on usually on well decaying logs. We have Pseudoarmillariella, quite a mouthful there, Chromosera, and the, I'd say more common, um, Chrysomphalina. And those are two species that I see a lot, at least in the lowlands. And they're both um, really beautiful, have these nice thick decurrent, de de sub decurrent or de decurrent gills here. And the uh, Arantiaca is actually fruiting a lot right now. And you can see those cute little hairs. I just think the hairs are so nice and a good distinguishing feature for this mushroom. Uh, the one on the right here, Chrysophila, can be easily misidentified as a winter chanterelle. A lot of people will ask us if that's what they found. Um, and they do have similar growth and appearance, but they definitely have these true blade-like gills there. So really nice, beautiful mushrooms. All right, and hygrosabies. So hygrosabies are uh, a really, really broad and interesting group. Their eco ecological roles and life cycles have not in been entirely understood. They've long been presumed to be saprobes on decaying grass roots, but they're now classified as biotrophs, which means they get their nutrients for, uh, at least partially from living tissue. And they can be found in a broad range of substrates, in woody debris and leaf litter, bare soil, terrestrially under maybe distinctive tree types, depending on the species. Um, in mixed grassy and mossy fields is a, is a good place to find hygrosabies, sometimes just purely grassy areas or kind of coming through moss terrestrially from the soil beneath. And they're really common along trail sides and banks of water. They have an affinity for disturbed or unproved sites, in quotes. Um, and so they can really uh, be growing places that lots of other mushrooms maybe can't. And that makes them one of the many things that makes it interesting in my mind. Uh, and it can be variable in Europe versus North America. You might have a species or at least think to have one species that's growing maybe strictly in, in grasslands in uh, in the UK, and then found in forests in the Pacific Northwest. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that uh, in a bit. So the moss dwellers, these are uh, really, really nice mushrooms. I don't get to see these ones as much, uh, though Arenia clarsania, the first one here, this beautiful blue one, can be found in pretty suburban and urban areas. Is, it it has... oh. Is there a question? I think someone just unmuted. Uh, it can be found, uh, yeah, in pretty developed areas. It ha you'll, be, you'll find it in the patches of polytrichum um, moss here, and it's pretty distinctly tied to this moss, but that moss will grow all over the place. So check your local patches and see if you can find this, this blue mushroom and document it. Uh, it's called the juniper haircap moss. And then um, I won't go into each species here, but generally these mushrooms are in mosses or nutrient poor soils in habitats like bogs and other wetlands. And those that are not growing directly on moss are at least suspected to be deriving nutrients from moss at some point in their life cycle. Um, my good friend Connor Dooley, also known as Corn Dog, an iNaturalist, has a great project called Sphagnum Associated Fungi in North America. And you can see, they're not all wax caps, but you can see which wax caps 
have been found by different observers um, in specifically sphagnum moss. So on the bottom, the bottom two you can see are in sphagnum, um, this really distinctive moss group. All right, lichenized groups. Let me take a sip of water real quick. I love the lichenized wax cap. So the groups of wax caps that are um, lichenized to have a symbiotic relationship with a photosynthetic partner who is providing sugar for them through photosynthesis, while the fungal hyphae provide structure and moisture retention. And so most people wouldn't recognize these mushrooms to be lichens because a lot of the, most of the lichens, really 90% or so, are associated with the ascomycete fungi. So when they fruit, they will make fruiting bodies that are more like the cup fungi, disc shaped or you know cup shaped. Not always, but that's the general tendency. You're not seeing this gilled mushroom morphology. And it's actually less than 1% of lichens are basidial lichens. And they're not all gilled, um, but here's a really great example of a, of a gilled lichen. A gilled, so this mushroom is only spreading the fungal spores. It's not um, spreading the part of the lichen that is their photosynthetic partner, um, but it is bound to this lifestyle. And this first species lichen Ampelia umbellifera is a really common species in the Pacific Northwest. You can find it on pretty well decaying logs and stumps, fruiting in large numbers when it's a good season. And um, you'll see also, sometimes there won't be fruiting bodies, but if you can notice these big round, oh, they're not big, but they're, they're distinctive green bubbles, kind of lighter green on a darker green mat. And that's actually the thallus. So that's the, the vegetative part of this lichen, which is made up of these algal balls. This is a green algae in this case, um, and the fungal hyphae living together. And if you see it enough times, you'll actually be able to kind of train your eye to, to notice that this lichen is present even without the mushrooms there. But inevitably you will see these mushrooms fruiting um, and they're really such a, such a delight. Um, here's on the bottom are two species that are less common. Hudsoniana is um, North American, even more North, more boreal uh, restricted. And it has this uh, really, we call it squamulos, these kind of leafy flaky bits. That's the, the vegetative part at the bottom there coming out. Um, and then on the left, this is uh, Lycanomphalia altoandina, and this one is only, it was only described in 2017, and it is recorded to grow in the Atacama Desert in Chile, up in higher altitude environments, and will fruit sometimes directly from the salt crusts, which is a pretty intense environment to be living in, and I, uh, I just think it's a spectacular species. Okay, so even though these look like blue turkey tail mushrooms, they're actually another waxy cap lichen. So instead of having a green algae like the previous species, these have a cyanobacterium as their photobiont. And so I said before, less than 1% of lichens have a basidiomycete partner and less than 10% have our cyanolichens and have a cyanobacterial partner. And so these, is a, uh, this, these groups are an extremely rare partnership of um, lichens and uh, it's just mind-blowing that they're in the hygrophoraceae. And so the the part, this leafy, freely colorful part, not always colorful, but you know, the main part that we're looking at in these photos is the thallus. So once again, the vegetative part and the fruiting bodies on these are actually only these very small, we call it siphaloid, these kind of like flat or disc cup kind of like shaped fruiting bodies. And you can see that in the upper right under the, the name Cora, which is one of the genera. And that's the fruiting body, just that white kind of flat tissue there, which is so interesting. And that name Cora and Corella, that comes from Corazon, so heart, because they have this kind of heart-shaped um, thalli. All right. And these are only found in Central and South America and some in the Caribbean a bit. So you're not going to find them up, up where we live, but I just thought you should know about them because uh, they're really just unbelievable. And they also have a variety of psychoactive uh, compounds in them, which makes them even more mind-blowing. 
I guess literally there. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna drink some more water. It's kind of dry up here. Any questions so far? Okay, you can come on mute. Talking a lot here. That's what I'm here to do. Okay, so the wax cap grasslands. Um, so the CHEG or CHEGD system was developed in Europe to assess the presence of four families, uh, of fungal families that make up about half the species that are found primarily in these grasslands that they were surveying. And that is the Claveraceae, Hygrophoraceae, Antilomataceae, and Geoglossaceae. And sometimes the D uh, is Dermaloma, which is in the Trichalomataceae is included, um, but not as frequently. And there was a scoring system that was established specifically for wax cap diversity to help determine local, regional, national, and international importance, kind of uh, how the presence of species in these families and in the Hygrophoraceae, uh, what does that mean for conservation and uh, specifically in the grassland habitat, which was a very natural um, habitat, especially in the UK, and has been heavily developed and used for agriculture and developed into, um, you know, suburban okay. neighborhoods. And, oh, okay, someone's unmuted. Uh, <laughs> Wendy, we got you unmuted. Okay, so let's take a peek here. Yeah, so it's like a habitat that we think of as more kind of like a lawn habitat here, but actually it's um, it's not the case in other parts of the world. So how, yeah, I'm sorry, I got a little thrown off here. Uh, all right, I'm just going to go, okay, WaxCap too. So WaxCap was an app that was developed for um, people in the community to go around and document um, mushrooms that they were seeing. Um, specifically wax caps and kind of help expand the efforts of looking at uh, where these mushrooms are growing and and it was really a successful endeavor because over 40 sites were added to these conservation efforts because people were just walking around where they lived and saying okay here's some wax caps in this grassy patch that had not been documented to be there maybe because they were small or just not you know previously uh, thought to be present any longer and so Something that makes uh, conservation difficult, is specifically in this case, is that um, plant and fungal diversity do not always correlate. And a lot of conservation agencies and government agencies that are looking to conserve land are looking at plant diversity. Okay. Okay. Yeah, everyone. Um, yeah, and so it's made it difficult to, to, to make a case for why these grasslands should be conserved. And so um, we're seeing large, like high, high fungal diversity in um, places where there's pretty low diversity, like in these grassy fields, there'll really only be a few kind of grassy um, plants growing. And so that makes sense. It's like, it's a super, super, super uh, decimated habitat and so we really you know there's lots of fungi that we're seeing living there and we really want to do everything we can to help um help preserve them and also endophytes i'll talk a little bit more about that in a second but we you know part of that correlation with the plant diversity and the fungal diversity is that um it was learned that some of these wax caps are actually living inside of these grasses in various parts of the grasses and so that just goes to show how ecologically valuable they are and living in a way that we did not previously think of them to live. So here was this uh, European study looking at uh, what's now Cufophilus virginaeus um, and it's titled Hygrosibi virginea as a systemic endophyte of Plantago lanceolata. And so that's uh, one of the plantain um, plants which are really common in the grassy fields and we have a lot that have been introduced into North America as well. And basically what the study ended up learning was that this species and sometimes Hygrosibi coccinea are actually living in almost every part of the plant through the root, in the roots, in the leaves and the seeds and actually being maternally transferred through the seeds into the young newly germinated plants. So it's actually this fungus is being transmitted through the germline of the plant that they're living within. And so this helps us on better understand that these hygrosity, they're not just living and eating decaying grass um, roots. They're actually an integral part to the life cycle of the plant, or at least 
to, uh, we don't exactly know what purpose they're serving, but if they're being transferred through the lives of this plant, there's a lot we can speculate about their importance and their, um, you know, their tie to these ecosystems. It's fascinating stuff. Makes my head spin, so thanks for following along. Okay, so the Hygrophoraceae of the Little Refugian Sound. Uh, here's a project that was started in 2017 as a North American Mycophora project um, under their NEP endeavors, and that's now known as the Fungal Diversity Survey. But initially, they just kind of, you know, I'm sure as many of you participated in um, anyone who was curious about a certain group of fungi or a certain area of land was able to say, hey, uh, okay, I want to learn more about these and apply for grants to have sequencing done. And so I got really lucky to meet Steve Ness, who uh, is a member of the South Sound Mushroom Club, and he was curious about the Hygrophoraceae. And by chance, just going to school at Evergreen and being in the Olympia area, I was finding lots of interesting waxy caps along with um, my friend Luca, who's here with me now. And we were able to contribute um, many specimens to this project and learn a lot about the diversity in the Pacific Northwest, which is always expanding um, as we continue these efforts. So there's been a lot of act active collaborations with community members, amateur and professional mycologists across the continent. And we've been really lucky to have experts look over a lot of our findings and help us better understand and interpret what uh, the data means. Because for me as a student, I was just seeing these beautiful, really interesting mushrooms, and I was not ever expecting them to come back um, stomping everybody as much as they did. All right, and now I will share some of our findings from these sequencing efforts. Just give me one second, I'm gonna sip some water and check on my notes. Okay, a little bit more about general sequencing. So like in this molecular era, waxy caps are not unique in that via sequencing, we're learning that many species in North America are distinct from their European counterparts, or that species that are the same in Europe and Eastern North America are different in the West, sometimes in multiples, and sometimes they coexist. So sometimes there can be different combinations of we have a mushroom that can also be found in the East North America and in Europe or any different variety or just in Eastern North America. And so that's like uh, been really insightful as we've sequenced these mushrooms and learned more about their ranges and also uh, trying to put our finger on species concepts, which is uh, dizzying trying to say like, does this mean we have two mushrooms here, three mushrooms here? Um, so they also are not always very straightforward when you sequence mushrooms in the standard way using the ITS barcode. It's not always effective. So if you're planning to sequence um, waxy caps, you'll need to find a lab that will do reruns or run multiple primers, sometimes custom primers. So if you're not in the sequencing uh, interest or realm, don't worry about that. But there's just a lot of uh, times that we'll send stuff in and get uh, inconclusive data because this specific part of the um, genome that we're sequencing seems to have a lot of variation and more than other groups of, of mushrooms. And this is particularly an issue with gliophorus and some of the hygrosopes. Okay, so hygrosopy flavifolia or gliophorus flavifolius. This is a really gorgeous super viscid mushroom that has bright yellow gills and was originally only thought to be growing in the redwoods and then Luca found it in Olympia uh, two years ago now I think which was a 700 mile range expansion it wasn't thought to be this far north it was found under western red cedar up here which is another member of the Cooper CCA as uh, the, the redwoods and that's where this mushroom is found growing in California and it, we found it again the year after. We kind of went back to the same general spot and found it fruiting, which was really exciting. And it is a species that's in the West Coast Rare Challenge for fundus. And I'll show you show you some more about that. But so it was really cool to, to find it while they were hoping people to even just find the mushroom at all, let alone so far out of its previously understood range. This was red. Mm. This is another one that was thought to be in just in California. There was like a couple, at least uh, had talked to some people and they said they had maybe seen it around the like Olympia area, but 
it was considered another range expansion. I when we found it, I just had never thought I had never seen it before. I didn't really think it was going to be that exciting, but uh, got to do a little write up for the Berker Barium and have it listed as one of the Washington mushrooms that you can find. And so that was really exciting uh, to, to, to be a part of. And it's a pretty big mushroom compared to the other hygrosities. It's got a really thick stipe um, and the whole mushroom is just much larger than other hygrosities. It's not really viscid ever, maybe kind of greasy and a uh, pretty bright red uh, cap in this thick yellow palish stipe and kind of a variable orangey creamy gill color. I accidentally broke the one in the middle there and it ended up being like some of the, the best of the photos I had taken, which was a little bummer, but it's not too bad. Okay, hygrosity varescens. Uh, so this is another pretty big hygrosity. Um, and I believe this one had also only been recorded in California. I'm not 100% positive, but it had a really interesting history of fruiting uh, where it would, would people who would, like mycologists who would check certain areas. So this is, I know Noah's here, so credit to Noah and Christian for mentioning this in the Redwood Coast um, entry for this mushroom because it is very, very interesting. So this mushroom would, would fruit and then maybe some people would see it and then it would not fruit for long periods of time. And then there were some places that were within its range that it would never fruit, that mycologists would check regularly and not see it. But then when it was recorded to fruit, it would like fruit all up and down the coast at the same time. Um, and so it's pretty mysterious why it does that. Um, but we got lucky to see it two years in a row uh, in several places in the Olympia area. And it is really spectacular, very, very vibrant lime green. And they'll also be sometimes brownish and orangey tones to it. And it has this thing that some of the hygrosabies do, uh, some of the bigger species, you can see the the bottom one on the left is kind of split. They get this like divot in the stipe and they'll sometimes just look like there's two mushrooms fused together. I'm not sure why they do that, but um, sometimes fluorescence will do that as well. It's kind of odd. So so finding this was a you know big thing to celebrate at a Noir Project's documentation of, of these wax caps. Okay, Cufophilus russocoriaceus. So this mushroom is, you know, kind of more nondescript than the other mushrooms. It's smaller, it's slender, it's got a pretty bright white color, but the most distinctive thing about it is the smell. It's got this really delightful cedary incense smell. The name uh, russocoriaceus directly means Russian leather, and apparently that's, those smells are synonymous, but I've never at least I don't think I've smelled Russian leather. And the smell can be so potent. Dave Largent says that he found it like 18 feet or away, meters away. I don't know, far away from the mushroom. But some people can't even smell it at all, even when others in the group are reporting to smell the smell, which is such a shame. If you haven't found this mushroom, um, please look out for it and sniff it. Um, and if you have, then you know how good it is. I hope it's one of my favorite mushroom smells. And anyway, so <laughs> we found some on the right that uh, a couple of times that we figured, oh, these must be more Russocoriaceus, got them sequenced anyways, just to kind of confirm, and then saw that they're not really matching. Well, the issue is that both both Cufophilus Russocoriaceus and this other species, Lorenzi, Lorenzii, which was described in Oregon, lack preserved, well-preserved types, but now we do have um, sequences available for Russocoriaceus. Um, and we have some matches in Washington, so we do know that it's there, um, but we do also have collections like this one that don't match, and we can only kind of infer that maybe they might be Lorenzii, which seems to be a little bit stockier, but does also smell good. Okay, the parrot mushroom, Gliophora citocinus complex or group, um, you know, it's questionable, like when we say, how many species do we really have? This is a good example of that because um, we've had Danny Miller look over a lot of this and he has a, a great write up on his site that I'll share a little bit later. Um, and he's saying that we're determining there to be four distinct, you, you know, distinctly unique species in the Pacific Northwest. It really depends on uh, what you want to call a species, but we know that there's a lot of diversity in this group, regardless of how you are going to interpret it. 
Um, and none of them are really good matches to the European species. So we know that we have our own here and we might have multiple of our own parrot mushrooms. And the color is completely unreliable for figuring out which group you have. There's only three groups pictured here. Um, the ones on the right are actually part of the same grouping of, of uh, sequences that we've gotten back, even though they're so different. This is the kind of faint peachy one on the bottom and then this range of green and blue up top. And the blue and orange ones um, are sometimes listed as a variety Bar californicus, um, but the sequences show to match our green ones pretty well. So um, I think it's safe to say that they're the same. And yeah, just even within each group, we can see color variation between fruitings, between mushrooms within a patch, and even between an individual mushroom itself. We can see multiple colors on a single mushroom and even um, watching that mushroom age, either by revisiting it or collecting it and seeing how it dries out, we can see different colors come through. So it's not something you can use to, to, to distinguish them. Um, and they all end up drying orange, really, basically, which is also kind of interesting. Um, and the fourth one, that's the reason it's not pictured here is because it was part of a mixed collection. So one of the collections I made even though it was only from one single patch, there was not any others around. Apparently within there, there was more than one species or what we're called, what has been called that. So I'm not really sure what the fate of this group is, but we do know that it is pretty diverse um, and you can find it in, in so many different um, shades. They really like um, Western red cedar habitats. Uh, so definitely check out that kind of forest. If, if you've got it mixed forest with, um, big leaf maple, uh, bluffs kind of with the maritime influence too. That's a spot that we've seen a lot of diversity in a lot of these wax caps. Um, we have a famous spot we call Wax Cap Hill where so many of these mushrooms have been found um, and doesn't fail to disappoint. And also one more thing is that the peachy, the one, the big peachy one on the bottom too, like if you're just looking at that from the top, that could be misidentified as Gleophorus laetus, which will have kind of more pinkish tones, but the, the gill attachment is um, the easiest way to distinguish between the two. The um, gills will be decurrent on Gleophorus laetus and not on Cytosines. Okay, so Phaeococcinea or Aphaeococcinea. Um, I might have a few of my AFs and CFs mixed up in this because that's always so hard to, to straighten out. But either way, so this is a mushroom that was called the devil stool. It was described in um, Europe and then found out here in the grassy areas kind of near the Tacoma um, area and the lawns there kind of in pretty developed um, places. And whether or not it's the same as the European has been questioned now over several years. It's got a pretty differing um, sequence percent. So between the two, it's around 4%, which kind of rides the line. Some people say 3% will be uh, enough to call something its own species. But mostly everything else about the mushrooms, the same as the European, including the microscopy, the spore size. and But that doesn't, you know, the spore, the microscopic features of this family don't vary much in general anyway. So um, the expert in this group thinks that they're likely, likely the same, um, but it's still not fully determined. So kind of a mystery. And a few more locations have been found since then, um, all within relatively the same part of Western Washington. So, but when they fruit, they fruit in really large numbers and they're super bright red. Uh, you can see just back the, how bright red the gills are, cap uh, ends, but they'll kind of fade into, or they'll have like dark scale sometime on the top. Um, okay. So here's another Chromosera af Um And this mushroom is currently listed to have a range that includes, um, Europe, Eastern North America, and Western North America, but we do know for sure that all three are different. And the one in Eastern North America is actually described, but it's described as a Mycena, Mycena lilacifolia. Um, and so that's gonna need its own name. And then the Western North American species will also need its own name. So our specimen uh, is gonna be included in that process of kind of rewriting um, or describing this mushroom, I guess, for the first time to science. And I don't, 
I'm not going to be part of that paper. I'm hoping it'll come out soon, but our, our sequence will be part of it, which is uh, exciting. Okay, and then I'll show you now a couple of our novel species. So meaning species that don't match anything that we have a current understanding of. Um, and so here's one of the, this is one of the first wax caps I, I really ever got sequenced. And so it was a big surprise to find out that it doesn't even closely match another species of hygrosity. So a lot of these other ones are mushrooms that we had an understanding of and you can find maybe in the field guide an entry for, but that we then learned by sequencing, oh, turns out it's probably, you know, its own species. In this case, there was really nothing. I didn't know, I didn't have the same identification skills as I do now. And so I just kind of figured it ought to be something I had never heard of. Um, and I still feel that way with a lot of the wax caps. They're, they're pretty hard to ID, uh, depending. But uh, anyway, so this mushroom was found in a pretty heavily trafficked area. Uh, and coming, fruiting, you can see next to it, and I'll show you another one that has a similar growth form. There's roots right there of the western red cedar. It's kind of uh, tucked pretty snug out coming out, not from the root, but right on, like alongside it. And I don't really know, you know, what's going on there. And people walk on this spot all day long, dogs trample over it. And so that just kind of goes to show that um, affinity for disturbance for some of these wax caps. And that picture, the in the, the first picture there's from the first year I found it and they were pretty mature. They weren't very viscid and they ranged a lot in color. There was yellow, red, orange ones, um, it was pretty strange. And then the next year or two years later, I went back and I found more mushrooms fruiting that I wasn't convinced were gonna match, but ended up matching. And they are pretty viscid when they're young and very small. So you can see there's a scale down at the bottom and some centimeters there. Uh, and once again, just coming out right from those, those root systems, it's, it's pretty fascinating. And they, when they're paired and like put into a phylogenetic tree, or at least the one that um, Gene Lodge had drawn up, it's pretty out there. It doesn't even really have anything we can say. Maybe it's near. I know I've already kind of said that, but it's like, it's crazy to see it as such an outlier. Um, I'm just rambling about all this stuff now. Okay, so here's the second um, novel species that was found just a couple of feet away from the one I just showed you. And I found it when I was looking for more of the first one. And I saw it and I kind of just figured, well, they look different, but maybe they're the same. The other ones had some red, um, but I kept the collection separate just to be safe. And it turned out they were different. And these also are um, undescribed. And, you know, and this isn't something that's like finding mushrooms that are, are not described to science. It a lot of times will sound like pretty shocking to people, but and I know a lot of you have been in mycology for a while, but uh, it's something that anybody can do if you're just out collecting enough and have the um, privilege to have them sequence. It's it's more common than you'd think. So just even in this one area, um, I was you know a couple feet away, I found these beautiful small red ones. And the biggest one we have recorded is only three centimeters long. They're very very small mushrooms, and they are almost a codioid in the way that they barely open up. The cap stays pretty closed and pretty tight against the mud that they're fruiting out from and do and so it's it's really curious how you know how they grow and how they spread their spores um, they kind of look like little berries which uh, reminds us of the kind of Australian North American mushrooms that will grow to mimic berries for ground birds but I don't think that's what's going on here so I don't know, there was one other collection that matched this one, and that one was in California, found by Peter Russell. So um, helps give us an idea of the range and the knowledge of knowing that there's more, more bo fruiting bodies out there, more, more sites. Okay, species knob three. Um, this one is, you know, all of these are just kind of like, you know, they don't look too unique. They kind of just look like your standard hygroscopy, or at least this one looks pretty, pretty normal. It's got this nice uh, kind of frilly margin of the cap and was found in a mo mixed mossy grassy area between two pretty heavily trafficked roads. And um, 
we call it Hygrosity parkwayensis just because it's found in the middle of a parkway. And I think the closest match to this one was Hygrosity constrictospora, but it's not a very good match. Uh, it's just kind of the closest sequence that we were able to get. Um, this is another we're hoping to describe and planning to describe in the next few years. And it was found fruiting al along other wax cap species and other Chegg species, so other um, yeah, that fit into that grouping of those four families there. We see that, so I mentioned that being something observed in Europe, but it's also something that we observe in other parts of the world, including North America. Uh, we see it a lot in Western North America, and we've even seen it in the tropics and other places like that. Okay, another outlier from Waxy Cap Hill. Um, so this one is really strange. This one could potentially be a novel genus, but it's unclear. The closest match, it, it really didn't have any consistent matches with the ITS, which is the standard. Uh, with the second primer that was done, LSU, there wasn't really a strong match. The closest was 91%, which is a pretty big gap. Um, and that was to a Cufophilus in Texas. And so maybe it's a Cufophilus. I thought it maybe looked like a pale Humidicutus, if you know that genus. There's some in the east that are kind of pale and white like this. And with that te type texture, the gill attachment doesn't really look like a, a Cufophilus, but it kind of dips down. Uh, I would think the gills would be a little bit more spaced and thick, but there was only one. Luca did find one, I think, it, per relatively um, close timing to when I found it, but it was not in good condition. So we'll see if we can find more of these. Keep your eyes out <laughs> for something like that looks like this, even though it doesn't have uh, anything super distinctive about it. It's pretty big. Uh, yeah, definitely, I mean, like five or five inches or so. Neat scale. Okay, Hygrosity Reedi. Um, the whole situation with Hyrosby miniata, do we have it, do we not? I'm not fully sure. I keep getting myself more confused about this, but the, the type apparently is not very um, very good for miniata. And it often, that name often gets applied to all different Hyrosby species. Like so many little reddish Hyrosbys get called Hyrosby miniata around the world. Um, and it's often misapplied and the diversity is usually much greater than, than that. And so in sequencing, um, these kind of smaller orangish reddish mushrooms with the decurrent gills, maybe uh, a scalloped margin like the one in the picture here. We're able to see, you can see this, this tree has mushrooms from Canada, UK, Washington, but the ones I have highlighted here are specimens from our project in, in Olympia, um, and they do match reedii. So we know we have reedii here, whether or not we have miniata also, maybe one of you can tell me because I think it, I thought it was also here too, but maybe we're maybe they're all radii. I don't. I'm not truly a, a genuine expert in all this. I just try my best to compile this information. Okay, other highlights. There's just so many that we've that we've um, been wowed by, and here's a couple more. I won't go into all of them. Um, this Cufophilus afferentius. That's a match that uh, was t uh, this specimen matched a Jamaican Cufophilus from the mountains and that was one of Luca's collections that was that really stumped us and I'm still not sure what you know the fate of that mushroom is but it doesn't look like anything that we've seen really around here so um, hopefully we'll find some more and let's see give me a second I'll just talk really quick. I'll skip Acuta conica. There's just a lot of species that we, you know, apply the same name to, and then we find out, okay, we have our own here. And so that's another one of them. Um, Parvula, that's one that uh, lots of names, lots of mushrooms across North America are getting called Parvula. And we're getting closer to straightening it out. Um, but between the East and the West, uh, it's not exactly pinned down where the true Parvula is. Um, Fenestrata, that is, that's mushroom. We don't even know really if it's a Gliophorus or a Hygrosibi, uh, um, but there are more collections being recorded. It has this uh, Fenestrata as in windowed. There's like a clear part of the upper, of the top of the cap that's, you can kind of, it's kind of translucent. And I think Glutenopes was like the closest name to that one. And so... Yeah, we have that one doesn't that one needs to be described um, or switched over. 
And then Gliophorus irrigatus, that's one that is, you know, described already, but we were really happy to see this mushroom. It's not very common up here, at least. And uh, Luke and I were leading a mushroom walk, and we're just so happy to, to see that mushroom fruiting. And then Laetus, I believe we have several different mm, mushrooms going on, or at least groups of mushrooms going under, going under the name Laetus. Um, we do have some more diversity in that group as well, uh, but those decurrent gills um, are at least one way to start to narrow down if you're in that general group. Okay, so, oh, okay, cool. Uh, here's a site uh, that I will share with you again in the form of a document that has resources, but Danny Miller, I'm not sure. I know Ian's on here. I don't know if you've been part of the site too, Ian, though they've uh, worked a lot together on the MycoMatch program. Um, this site has kind of our most updated, at least, or attempting to be the most updated understanding of the diversity of wax caps in the Pacific Northwest. And you can kind of like click to expand these different sections and, and see um, each, like each of the different groups, some of the different genera and the species that have been going by one name that we learn there's diversity, more diversity for. Um, and so I definitely recommend checking out this website. Uh, I am honored to be listed on here as one of the contributors of specimens that has helped fuel, you know, our un expansion of knowledge on this group. Um, and it, I always go and reference, I, I say, what's the, what are we thinking that we're calling this thing? And I'll just pop over to this site and see uh, what Danny's got. And I'll say, okay, oh yeah, that's, we've, we've got two of these things and they're not the European. Okay, commonly observed taxa. So this is just like a screenshot from the United States uh, of iNaturalist species that are most commonly observed. And it's totally not, um, the most accurate and I, I wanted to include it partly because of that because you can see that the first thing here is the golden wax cap hyrosibi fulvescens and so fulvescens is a more eastern species described from Michigan. Um, ours is a closer match to that species than it is to the European hygrosibi chlorophana um, but it's still unique and so uh, it's a similar situation with the witch's caps. We have a lot of mushrooms um, going under these names, once again with miniata. And so it's showing that these are the most commonly observed, but you can just, it's safe to assume that each of these encompasses several species and is truly a species group. Um, and so naturally they'll, they'll end up being identified on, online as being the same thing. And so it's just like a good, good thing to keep in mind when you're looking at stuff like this and kind of trying to get a feel for the diversity. Here is the, I'm almost done, just so everybody knows. <laughs> Here is the uh, West Coast Rare Fungi Challenge. I was a volunteer for a year helping them kind of expand from 10 to 20 species. And my choice actually wasn't a wax cap. Mine is number eight, Pseudoluria penultiana. That's my photo there. This is a really nice uh, rare cup fungus that is thought to be only in uh, old growth, but can be found in other habitats, sometimes too. Anyways, let me go to the next slide here, and you can see that three of these species are in the Hygrophoraceae, and so um, these are just uh, mushrooms that, that not everybody considers all of these to be rare, and as the project has gone on year after year, we've learned that some of them are even, um, you know, they're more abundant than we thought. It's just kind of a way to engage people and get them out and, like, looking in more unique habitats and looking for maybe lesser documented fungi with the goal of providing, you know, getting them sequenced um, having them up on INAT and providing more information for conservation agencies to inevitably, you know, hopefully conserve areas. So keep, keep your eyes out for any of these. You can go on the website, uh, the Fungal Diversity website. If you type in West Coast Rare Challenge, you can read up. There's a pamphlet for each species. It'll tell you the habitat, show you more photos, and give you more identification characteristics and how to participate in the project. Okay, so just some general features to note when you're identifying, when you're trying to identify a wax cap or you think you have a wax cap. Um, and these are things that you can use for other groups as well, but these are like definitely note these for the waxies. Um, substrate, so what it's growing on, is it growing on wood or in the duff uh, or on moss? Habitat, general habitat, is it a stream bed? Is it a bluff? You know, is it uh, alpine type habitat? And habit, so is it singular? Are there a couple 
kind of scattered? Are they growing out from a cluster? That's, you know, what that's referring to. And then viscosity. So how slimy and gooey is the mushroom? Uh, that's a really important for this family because the, the, if the mushroom is viscid or not, and what parts of the mushrooms are viscid and how viscid they are, are all different things that we can use to help distinguish different groups. So check the cap and the stipe, um, you know, note whether or not they're viscid or not. And then here's a little spectrum. If it's dry, you know, you're not feeling, your fingers aren't sticking to the mushroom at all. Excuse me. If it's greasy or sticky, you're touching it and you're kind of, you know, it kind of feels like it's been buttered up a little bit. The gills will have that feeling a lot too, but um, yeah, it's not necessarily, so you can feel that it's a little bit buttery, but you're not pulling off slime when you move your fingers away. It's not just removing kind of glop with it. And then viscid is more like, okay, you're touching it and you're kind of getting, you're seeing that there's some slime sticking to your finger. Um, and glutinous is when it's just basically drenched in slime and it's maybe dripping off the edges and there's just kind of like a mountain of, of, of goo on top. Um, so that's the most <laughs> slimy that it can be. Um, and then gill attachment, like I said, some species, like a lot of these species are really hard to differentiate between. And, and that's even with a field guide. And we know, like I said, how many don't fit in um, to our current understanding. So uh, gill attachment is one that can help see it, this can be super variable. You might even have a one mushroom where, you, you know, can look like it's attached several ways, but do your best to, to describe how it's attached, especially if it's relatively straightforward. Like if it's decurrent or subdecurrent, that's awesome. Um, cap texture, are there little scales or hairs on it? That can help a lot. And within hygrosophy, even you'll see um, that mentioned tons in the descriptions if it's got little scales. Um, and if those scales are a different color, et cetera, colors of the cap, um, the stipe, the gills, and a lot of these parts of wax caps will come in gradients and have kind of color changes. So you might try to write a description and say like, well, each part of it's three different colors. Write that down, you know, to the best of your ability. It, it, it's dizzying, but at least they're, you know, they're pretty beautiful. So they make up for being uh, so troublesome. <laughs> And then here's some resources. Uh, there's not like a huge breadth of resources, but there are some. Definitely look up uh, work by Jean Lodge and her colleagues. I will uh, share a document that has this and more on it. And um, yeah, the, the North American species of Hygrophorus, which there's a Hygrophorus in the cover because they used to be Hygrophorus. Um, that's a outdated book but still like one of the most referenceable texts that we have for North American wax caps so that's like the original text that we can look at um there's also the uh, large acaricale section um that has a lot of information on the wax caps as well the swims hygrophorus key your guys's key or the key council's key um it needs updating it needs a lot of updating but it exists and it's something that you can reference. Um, of course, Mushrooms the Redwood Coast, which I always reference as being a great field guide for all mushrooms. Um, and then iNaturalist Mushroom Observer are places you can share uh, wax caps that you find and there's tons of people out there looking out for them. You have to be careful that somebody doesn't come in and just slap a name of something that it looks like on there. You know, do some research and don't just let somebody tell you it's one thing. If it's somebody cred credible, then, you know, uh, maybe you have to worry less, but um, it's a good place to share what you find. There's also the Hygrophoracy of Lower Puget Sound project on there. That's the one, the South Sound project that I was involved with. And you can see uh, a lot of the mushrooms in there have been sequenced and we'll have sequenced data on um, the observation. And then there's just general ID book, uh, pages on Facebook, which I mean, uh, they're hit or miss. And there's also one that's called Hygrosophy Fungi Forever, which is like an international page of people mostly just sharing photos of nice ones that they find. But if you like to look at, you know, pretty wax caps, it can be fun for you to join that group. And then here's just some references of different sites and papers that I um, looked at and compiled information from for this presentation. And thank you. There's my email.
and my iNaturalist, and I think my Instagram's on there. I can't see it. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have questions. Uh, like I said, I'm not an expert in this. I just uh, have participated a lot with them, and I really do love them and uh, learning about them all the time. So thank you for having me, and I'll happy, be happy to take any questions if there are any. Yes. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, I'm going to go around here first with the uh, members who are present. Has anybody got some questions? I'll come and give you the microphone. Nobody? Oh, Adolf Cheska? It may buzz. Hello. I wonder, we have some... Uh, Early spring or January, hydrophones, which are all used to call sub agrantisms. Do you know it? Uh, we may oh, have... It's hard to hear. It's hard to hear. Um... Can you say that again? Yeah. Um, we had something which uh, we called. Uh, Hydrophones are sub fragrantissimus. Sub grandissimus? Fragrantissimus? I don't know my hydrophores very well. I'm just going to throw a start by saying that. Um, Noah's here too and can, I'm sure, it has some uh, insights. I I'm not sure I know that species. Um, I don't find a lot of hydrophores, honestly. That's part of why I don't really know them very well. Um, yeah, they tend to be more montane, even though they're not restricted to the mountains. No, it is around Victoria, and uh, it is in January, this time of year, coming soon. Is, uh... Sorry, yeah, it's hard to hear. I, I, yeah. I kind of got what you're saying. Sorry that it's I'm not able to answer. Did you say Noah was present? Uh, could he make a comment, please? Did you say Noah was present? Yeah, I don't know if he wants to say anything or not. No, do you know which hygrophorus they have talking about? It's it's like it's yeah. The, if you're gonna take, maybe you can bring the mic to people in the audience, David, because I could really barely hear that. Yeah, I. Uh, I'm just trying to go through the chat. Um, oh, Noah's saying that there's no microphone. Um, Noah, did you hear <laughs> what the reference was? Okay, yeah, I'm going to look through the chat too. Let's see. Uh, oh, with the orchids, with the seed transfer. Yeah, orchids need fungi for, for germination. Uh, so it's very similar in that way. I guess I don't know if they're being transferred via the seed. So I think, I don't know the method that they find each other, the fungi and the orchids. Can you see some of the chat? I can see it now. Yeah, I wasn't able to see it during the presentation. Um, I had a question I, that I, I left in the chat, if you want. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah, you were talking about the ITS variation being really high, I think, in hygrophoracy in general. And mm -hmm. I was curious about if you think that it's the family of Basidiomyces that has like the highest ITS variation, like how is the speciation going with it in general like is it really challenging it's it's yeah it's challenging <laughs> um i you know i don't know enough about all the other families i know that there's okay jack's here i know that there's other families that have variation like um okay i'm just jack you want to take this one over <laughs> sure um hi i'm jack uh That's yeah like you'll see a ton of ton of distance regularly between things that look similar four eight twelve percent but you see that too in in some other families um a lot of species of romeria will have that um yeah i'm trying to think what else you got romeria that'll have that a lot of entolomatoids will have a lot of variation but it's kind of case by case in entoloma um, and I think that that trend is telling us something about how these organisms pass on their genetics that maybe we're just not getting right now, because you'll see groups where reliably ITS is wildly variable, 
And then you'll see groups where reliably ITS is very, very, very much the same. Um, I'm thinking of Cortinarius right off the top of my head. Lexinum, right? Uh, almost all bully tailies. ITS might not even be very useful for a lot of bully tailies, but. But sometimes you're just getting a lot of all the same information and it's not helping you figure out what's what the species diversity is. And sometimes it's so wildly variable that it has to make us reevaluate re our idea of the species concept. Like, you know, there's some general percentages that are given that people will say maybe 3%, but if we follow that for every group, there's a lot of revision that would need to be done. And there's a lot of experts that would say, no, we need to go by a different percent for this group. And so we're learning and figuring it out as we go. And um, yeah, the wax caps are so um, mysterious in that way. There's a lot of variation. Richard Winder, you have a question? Um, yeah, I very interesting talk, Lauren. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. I wanted uh, to ask uh, if you've ever thought, probably not, and so this is maybe more of an observation, but um, I'm fascinated by the Redwood uh, uh, story that you were telling and, and then finding it f uh, the one species further to the north. Um, redwoods are planted in, in the Pacific Northwest and in BC. And I'm just wondering if you've ever thought of looking around some of these ex situ redwoods uh, uh, because there's growing interest in, for example, assisted migration of redwoods as a climate change adaptation strategy because it's declining in its, its native range. And so I worry about some of these fungi that maybe they're not essential mycorrhizal partners, but they're kind of the ancillary or, or uh, uh, hangers on, if you will, in terms of the community that, uh, that, that a really part and parcel of the redwood community. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to put that bug in your ear that that um, maybe not even just redwoods, but some of these ex situ plants that that are from further south that nevertheless are thriving uh, in Washington State, Oregon, and, and in BC might be an interesting place to look to see either whether some of these things have been introduced or yeah. whether or whether the the uh, ex situ plant could like bait out or tease out things that you wouldn't otherwise know were there or 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 whether there's just sort of a, a, a natural part of this uh, the the landscape anyway just a thought yeah I, um so like when I see redwoods, I'm going to hand it to Luca in a second because Luca's from California has observed a lot of fungi both in California and Washington in the redwood forest and in the western red cedar forest. Personally, in the places that I've seen um, redwoods growing in the Pacific Northwest, it's never been in large numbers. It's only ever been one or a couple of trees. You know, they're massively outnumbered, of course, by the native western red cedar. Um, and the fungi that we're finding, are the, specifically the ones that I mentioned that are known from these redwood forests, are not in areas that have um, redwood. So like, you know, in the, yeah. we've surveyed the area pretty extensively and we know that they're like, those at least in that situation aren't being transferred over. Um, it could happen in, in other situations. And do you, do you want to say something? Like um, yeah, so basically, yeah. So I've looked at redwoods back in California, but I've also looked at the planted redwoods a lot to try to find waxy caps here in the Northwest. And the waxy caps that I find with planted redwoods are generally what I would think of more as being lawn associated waxy caps rather than tree associated ones. Um, like Hygrosopy saracea would be one. Um, and that's just more with like having to do with like, oh, somebody has a really mossy lawn and they don't fertilize it very much. Um, and so it makes a little facsimile of the European waxy cab habitat there. Um, but I also think that a lot of our red cedar waxy caps are the same or very similar to redwood waxy caps. And I think if the redwoods do manage some sort of a migration up north in the future, those mushrooms probably would be able to transfer over. But I, I don't know. I couldn't say for sure. Yeah, it's something that we'll have to like continue observing. So if you know areas that have um, redwoods, 
we'll definitely check them out regularly. Well, there, there's nothing official right now, but I, I know there's at least one citizens group in Seattle, for example, that's uh, um, looking to amp up uh, plantings of redwoods in, in the Seattle area. I, although I think they're using shoots, they're not using seedlings. So uh, anyway, it would be interesting to monitor as the, these sorts of things increase. And also Seattle and Portland, the, both of those cities have uh, tree boulevard tree inventories where you could actually, um, you know, GPS coordinates and all that actually find out where all of these things are established already to a greater de degree, perhaps. But uh, anyway, just uh, something I worry about that we, we worry a lot about the uh, with, with assisted migration of trees about the mycorrhizal stuff that are the key partners. But yeah. I think that the, the, the other greater part of the community that depends on redwood presence, uh, uh, we need to, to worry about that too. Definitely, yeah, and we might, you know, there aren't extensive studies that go into necessarily figuring this out. There are more and more, but um, not exactly, you know, as much as we need at, at the rate that we're seeing the climate change. Um, and we know that the reds, the, the redwoods, you know, will probably do pretty good here, at least to some degree, as we see the western red cedars have these massive die-offs. Um, and they are in the same family. And so we think that really there's more of a trend that the specificity of hosts is less than previously thought to be. So that's like our understanding was that, okay, we have these massive redwood forests in California. We've just seen these mushrooms in these forests. Um, and that maybe because the climate's a little different, they fruit less in the north because they do, they are recorded, a lot of them less up here than they are um, in California. And, but I would think that. I think they've been less studied up here too. Yeah. They're like, they're out in the Part of the year when people aren't mushrooming here and they are mushrooming down in California. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's a variety of things. And a lot of it, I think, like my, more than I aim to show with the presentation, like I want you to, to take away that, oh yeah, all these species, there's more going on here than we thought, but also just to highlight that you going out there, like I was just going out between classes and after class and like I was going out a lot, but you know, anybody can document something that can change our concept of a species, you know, and, and their expand their range. Um, so definitely just like you're saying, you're, you're curious about this. So go out and survey those areas and like, you're inevitably going to find something that's interesting, even if it's not as big of a scale of, of change, you know. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, Lauren, I'm just looking at Noah's uh, po uh, chat post. And um, Teresa wondered first if what Adolf was referring to was how Grosby's subfederescence, and Noah's replied as uh, was it Hygrophorus subaromaticus? Yes, and then Jack is saying sequence collections of Hygrophorus subaromaticus have been found, and sequences are close to Gliophorus. That Hygrophorus, if it's what Adolf was mentioning, is definitely an oddball. I hadn't heard of that, but that IPS is sequences. Yeah, and if it's one primer, it's like you know, it's not as much information. But that's very strange. I don't. I hadn't heard that. If I may step in for a second about the genetic stuff, I think that uh, the the major takeaway here is that uh, we're only using a little tiny bit of the genome, uh, and we really can't draw broad distinctions about what the whole organism is doing just based off of these little pieces of DNA that we're looking at. Um, and yeah, I don't know why exactly they would be so variable in this group or, or, or some groups and not others, but. And the I reason ITS gets to use, it's because it's like thought to be this area that's like less variable than others. Um, but we're seeing by, do, by, you know, by really harping on this one part, we're saying, okay, it actually can be more variable than we thought. Why? To be figured out. Um, but having multiple primers, like Jack and Luca are saying, is a way, uh, integrative taxonomy. We want to gather as much information as we can. And now that sequencing is getting cheaper, um, we're hoping that this is able to be accomplished and that we can have a better idea of what's go going on and what's related to what and what is what, you know. So we need more information, um, for sure. And then someone was asking about Flavifolius being mycorrhizal. 
And yes, Angelica, I think. I don't, we don't know the ecology of that one. Um, I would guess it's probably an endophyte with a moss or something small on the forest floor, but it's not known. It's not known to be a mycorrhiza or at all where it, where it lives? No, it's not known. Um, that one's really mysterious. That one's, you just find it as a mushroom. It's, it's probably okay, one of the a fungus or a soil fungus, so it's probably associated with the plant somewhere, but nobody really knows where in those dark forests. Do they ever uh, take advantage of another mycorrhizal fungi that's already there? So let's say you could have another one that's there, but then the hygrocide gets nutrients or, or absorbs, heterotrophically absorbs nutrients from the other fungus that's already um, an affiliate? I mean, fungi can do that for sure. Um, oh. But in this case, I don't think that there's waxies that we know to be yeah. pulling nutrient from a mycorrhizal connection. There's like, there are a whole variety of like, like a lot in the bolatales, you'll see a lot of um, if, like gumphidius on swillus, which is mycorrhizal with trees. Right, so that's right. a good example. But I don't think we have that could be happening, but it's I don't believe it's documented. If that was statement. happening, we would be finding their mycelium more in the soil. Um, and we tend to not find their mycelium in soil samples, but it's more in plants or in close association with plants. Okay, interesting. Okay, thanks very much. Right. It's getting late. Uh, one last question, Lauren. Um, yeah. Um, does anyone want to say one? I'm just so like, I think we've got, gotten to a lot of these uh, questions. I think we've covered most of it. If yeah. you all have got a question on the Zoom, uh, just press your space bar and hold it down oh. while you ask the question. Jack also said we need to do more microscopy. That is also true. I need to do more microscopy. All right. Everybody does. Thank you very much, Pressy. <laughs> and Lauren, I'm going to thank you very, very much for all your time and expertise. Um, terrific presentation. And uh, I'll try to give you a call tomorrow. Okay, and just so everybody knows, on the Zoom, I shared a link to a resources document. Um, and so click on that before the meeting ends to save it. And David, I can send you that so that you can pass it along to anybody who's there in person. Sure. As well. If you um, look at all the recordings uh, on the where it's the heading, subsequent data is always got the uh, re re resources posted. So you can just click on them or copy them and paste. All right. And I'll do the same with your ones, uh, Lauren. That's why I was going to phone you tomorrow to get a list of all those resources and put them on uh, our website. Thank you all for your questions and for being so engaged and showing up tonight. And Terrific. We're all just trying to figure this out, you know? Thanks, Lauren. All right. Thank you, so thank you Lauren. Document your wax, everybody. <laughs>